What's up guys? So in this video, it's more of a interview with Matt Pearls. He's the DeFi daddy of the Stargate community. So in the Discord, right here, Matt Pearls DeFi daddy. If you wanted to get in touch with Matt about DeFi, he's my most trusted connect when it comes to the DeFi space. Because us being the Stargate community, we're we're mostly in like our PXLM, ISO type stuff, you know? But DeFi space, there's a lot of gems in there. We don't want to bat an eye over at that sector of the cryptocurrency space. So Matt Pearls is the official DeFi daddy of the Stargate community. He gives us the DeFi demo, the rundown, the core things that we need to know when entering into the DeFi space. And he's going to be our connect as far as anything DeFi related. He's got our back. So if you want to go shoot him a friend request, you can do that as well as any questions, just tag them. You know, you can write, do at DeFi Daddy, at Matt Pearls, and ask him any questions, and he has got our back. He also has a newsletter when it comes to the DeFi space. I think he pushes it out weekly. I'll put the link in the bio here for his newsletter. It's called Crypto Clarity. So Matt, welcome aboard, and let's get it started. All right, can you see this, Rob? Yep, I can see it. All right, hey, what's up, everyone? My name's Matt. Welcome with Rob today to walk everyone in Stargate through just kind of a DeFi 101 crash course. Um, not really going to get too in the weeds in anything, but really just give people an understanding of why you would want a self-custody wallet, the different mm -hmm. things that you can do with it, the terminology and things that you'd come across, as well as some other interesting things that I've come across in the space, such as helpful tools or just innovative protocols and networks that I've been exploring. So really the first step is to get a self-custody wallet. Really the biggest on and off ramp for crypto has been centralized exchanges. I mean, through FTX and, and really a lot of other issues, you've seen the challenges that can come from that. But one of the really the biggest issues that crypto faces right now is that we're pretty dependent on those on and off ramps of centralized exchanges because to really even get started with a lot of these DeFi protocols and truly utilize one of these self-custody wallets you need to be transferring in crypto from somewhere else. So for me specifically, that's Coinbase. I try not to really leave many assets on there. However, I will send money back and forth. And that's where I do use my bank account to on and off ramp these assets. Mm -hmm. So for the purposes of this, I'm a MetaMask user. I'll be using the MetaMask wallet. I personally have used MetaMask for a few years and become pretty dependent on it. There is certain people that will illustrate pros and cons of MetaMask, and a lot of new wallets are emerging. So I'm not saying it's the best option. It's just really what I've become familiar with. Yeah. So really simply, you go to MetaMask website, a really important thing with DeFi in general, downloading anything. And furthermore, once you have your decentralized wallet and you're out exploring different protocols and things, it's insanely important to make sure you're using official links, whether that comes from the person's Twitter page or the company's website, whatever it is. There's a lot of scammers out there that have kind of developed front ends that look similar to these protocols, similar to these applications, and they'll actually try to get your information by masking what the site might look like or having you kind of connect your wallet to what you shouldn't connect your wallet to. Mm -hmm. So really, whether it's MetaMask or another wallet, the functionality the terminology is going to be very similar. The, the design of the wallet, the user experience might be a little different, but simple download. And one of the most important things to note when you first download one is security for your wallet. In a lot of cases, you're going to have a significant amount of money in these. You're going to have a lot of your investments and, and obviously you're going to want to make sure that your wallet is as safeguarded as possible. Mm -hmm. What you do uh, when you do create a wallet, I'm not going to do one for the purposes of this video, but really the big step that you run into is creating a secret backup phrase. Uh, so this is not something where you're coming up with a, a password that has a lot of different characters and things like that. This is actually a phrase that MetaMask gives you when you create your wallet. And it's one of the most important things that you'll have with your wallet. It's something that shouldn't be shared with anyone, not even really necessarily the people in your family. And another misconception with it is people will store it online sometimes. Sometimes they'll email these phrases to themselves to you know, keep an easy database of it. Mm -hmm. But I've even heard terrible stories about you know, maybe someone's cloud being hacked or you know, someone getting the information from someone's computer server, using it to get into their wallet. 
And from there, really all your assets are at risk. So what I've done personally is I wrote down this phrase on a piece of paper and stored it in a few places in my in my house. And that's really the level of security that I've gone to. If you lose the phrase yourself and you lose the device that you access your wallet on, you won't be able to access your assets. If you've heard um, the horror stories of someone losing a, a pen drive with a bunch of Bitcoin or anything on it, that's because these things are so secure that if you yourself <laughs> don't know your backup phrase, you won't be able to get into it. Um, if someone else gets their hands on this, they'll have essentially the full access to your wallet as you would. So it's a, a random phrase of a bunch of different words that that don't really make any sense together. But the importance is writing this down, hiding it somewhere physically and not storing this data online. Yeah, no screenshots and keeping it on your phone, that's for sure. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's something that that you think would be kind of like the standard in a sense. And when I first got my wallet, that's how I stored it until I heard of someone who who was hacked in that way. Yeah. Uh, so when you do get your wallet, you'll see I have a bunch of different wallets uh, as a lot of different wallets allow different coins and different networks. Uh, so for the purposes of this video, here's a wallet I have. What you'll see is at the top bar, this is just MetaMask logo. This would be my profile. So for various reasons, someone might have multiple users or multiple wallets. You could get across the different ones there. You can also create a new one. You could import one using that seed phrase that I previously mentioned, and you can view various settings. An important thing to note is that for every blockchain, it's gonna look very similar and, and essentially have the same interface. But for every blockchain, you're going to have a, a different kind of drop down in different assets living in each one. The Ethereum network has much different tokens than the Solana network. Mm -hmm. So you can't necessarily hold Solana assets on this Ethereum network. Uh, and these are more things that I'll get into right after this, but it's just really a simple drop down. Arbitrum is my favorite network. So most of the time I'm navigating between Ethereum, Arbitrum, and Optimism, which is another layer too. And that's mainly just because maybe I want exposure to an asset that's on the Arbitrum network that there's really no way to buy it on a centralized exchange or on Ethereum mainnet at this point. Mm -hmm. What else you'll see is Ascend. So this is a main feature of this, obviously, with a self-custodied wallet, very easy, seamless to send money, simply pasting a wallet address here. What you'll see is this is my wallet address. A wallet address is a very long stream of characters and no one has the same one. So this would be me sending money to myself, but essentially all you need is someone's wallet ID to send the money. And really that's kind of your IP address or your virtual identifier for your wallet. Mm -hmm. These numbers get obviously very long, complex and lost. So what a lot of people have done is worked with something called Ethereum name service to customize theirs. Uh, so you could have, you know, rob.ens and mm. that would essentially route all the transfers going there to your wallet address uh, assuming that that name hadn't been taken nice so that's sending for receiving simply that wallet address that i copied you would kind of just paste send to a friend make sure that they have your wallet address there's a few other things you can do such as if you're with the person a simple qr makes it easier obviously makes it so that there's no human error there and then scrolling down the swap and the buy, the buy is to essentially avoid the central exchange on ramp and kind of buy Ethereum straight through MetaMask. Mm -hmm. However, at this time, it's not really favorable, at least to US customers, not something I've done. And swap is how you swap tokens on the Ethereum network. But this is done through MetaMask and it's not the most efficient at this time. I use a protocol called Uniswap, which is one of the most popular DeFi protocols. And I'll be walking through that at some point. Nice. So then what you see is if you scroll down, it gives you all your assets that are on the Ethereum mainnet. That's a funny one. <laughs> that was a, a rug pull for sure. But basically these are tokens. This is an old wallet. So I'm not even really utilizing this too much. Uh, but you'll see I have some Ethereum in there, some other tokens. Mm -hmm. If you ever want to add anything else, if you get some tokens in your wallet, uh, MetaMask is smart enough now where it will pick up on that. You can just press a simple button it will pop up. If you're thinking about buying a token, if it can't recognize it for any reason, you'd press import tokens. 
And from here, you just input simply the address of the token. So just as I have this address, that is my identifier for my digital wallet. Every protocol, every token has its own unique address so that it's easy to find them. And then the only other really feature of this is if you want to view your past activity, you can really see all the stuff that's happened on the wallet. So diving into, the, into any of these transactions, you can see the transaction fee you paid, which is called a gas fee on the network, and really dive into a bunch of different details about the transaction, the involved parties, and just being on the blockchain, everything is fully transparent and viewable at any time. Mm -hmm. So this is really how the interface looks for MetaMask. As I said, other wallets are very similar. And what we would do now is assume you get on, you've messed around with Ethereum mainnet, which is what I did for really the first year or two of being deep in DeFi. And then when I started to explore different protocols, one mistake I made was seeing a token or seeing something I wanted to buy and thinking it was simply too much work because uh, it wasn't one step available through Ethereum mainnet. And it was just something I kind of avoided. That proved to be a huge mistake at the time because what happens is a lot of the things on the smaller networks are the ones that you know, might have the most potential to grow, assuming that they survive. Mm. And so that's something that I've kind of gone back on. And I've, I've really spent the last 12, 18 months exploring a bunch of different networks out there, starting with Solana during that boom, now yeah. moving to the layer two protocols. Yeah. So when it comes to, you know, all these different networks out there, you can't hold mainnet Ethereum on the Solana network. You can't hold uh, a token that was launched on the Ethereum network on Polygon. Uh, it's essentially the same thing as trying to download a file on your computer that's a PC file if you have a Mac. It's simply just not compatible. It can't read it. It, it just doesn't operate together. Yeah. So for this, there's all these different chains around. So if you are wanting to explore another chain, to add it to your MetaMask wallet up here, it's really as simple as just connecting your wallet on this trusted site called chainlist.org, connecting it here, and you can manually enter these info or this info, but just makes it really a lot easier to be able to approve it using this site, knowing that you know you've uploaded the right network and you can transact from there. Hmm. So once you really have all that done, you're set up on DeFi, you've transferred in some Ethereum, you're ready to go and you see a coin that you want to purchase. So this is a lot different than centralized exchanges in the, I guess, for several reasons. What you'll do is you'll kind of connect your wallet. And from here, you'll see that I now have the ability, uh, this was a brand new wallet, to transact, to trade coins, to swap whatever token on the Ethereum network I wanted. And there was no account creation. There was no you know, really onboarding process or clearing of funds or really any centralized intermediary at all. So it's really just the ability to, if Rob launched a token right now and attached some liquidity to it, I could buy it on Uniswap one minute later. Um, yeah. That's just, that's really how it works. And that's crazy. So what you'll do, Uniswap works with all the different networks as well. So, you know, Ethereum has some tokens, Arbitrum has some tokens, Polygon has some tokens. Whatever network your token lives on is the network that you essentially need to be trading on. Mm -hmm. And you need to have Ethereum on that network as well. Mm -hmm. So for the purposes of this, right now, I'm connected to the Ethereum network. And say right now, Aave, which is a lending protocol, I wanted to buy some Aave. Right now, I don't have any money in this account. Let me see. Oh, yeah, so it connected to a different thing. So right now, you'll see just a little bit of Ethereum in here. But you, what you'd be able to do is say I wanted to go buy some Aave. You really just go in, and it's as simple as a swap. So instead of paying uh, a fee that you would pay to a centralized exchange for a transaction or like you would pay to a brokerage for stocks, what you're doing here is you're actually paying a gas fee to the network for usage. So you're paying the Ethereum gas fee to transact on their network. And then there's a much, much smaller fee coming out of your trade 
it's actually going to the parties that are providing the liquidity so that this trade can happen. The way centralized exchanges would work is they have a ton of assets that can be exchanged and they're essentially exchanging them and taking a fee. In this case, a lot of the people that own the Aave token are now providing the liquidity, just as a lot of people that own Ethereum are providing that liquidity so that everyone in this DeFi world can trade these tokens freely. Hmm. So this would essentially, based on how much liquidity there is, this would be the slippage or the potential variation that could happen from your trade. So you're talking about a, a quarter of a percent there. If you go to swap, what you'll see is price impact would be essentially that that slippage I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. You'll have a network fee, which is in relation to the gas fee. The network fee is fully dependent on how many people are currently transacting on the blockchain right now. If you go on early in the morning, I might be able to make this transaction for a quarter of the cost, mm -hmm. but it, it's 100% dependent. Maybe there's a big NFT mint going on at that time. And this number jumps to 80 and, and you want to wait because you know a few minutes later it will go down back to normal levels. But really as simple as this, it's it's really just a swap. So what you'll see is this is not going to let me actually pull this transaction because I, I don't have the sufficient amount of Ethereum to cover the gas fee that would be in addition to this. But it's really just a, a simple transaction here where you pull down... As you can see, the network's very busy right now. Also, another reason why I use some of these layer two networks, they've really worked to, to solve this scalability issue that, that Ethereum has. So the fees are a lot cheaper, but you'll see that soon. Uh, really, what's important to note here is it's quoting you and it's including the gas fee. And here's essentially what you would expect to pay. Constantly changing as the network is changing with activity. But really, assuming you wanted to buy this, assuming you had the sufficient gas and the amount to buy it, you confirm here, does a little loading wheel, but there your transaction's gone through. Regardless of the loading wheel, that's really just a user experience thing, something for you to look at. What's happened is the transaction's already kicked off in the back end, and you'll be able to essentially view the transaction and everything about it on Etherscan as everything's fully transparent. So say I go to one of these transactions further. Oops. Right now, what I'm doing is I'm opening up the Etherscan block explorer. So as the, the blockchain is fully transparent, what you can do is you can view every transaction with its transaction hash, the exact timestamp of it in the exact exchange and involved parties at any given time. And this information will be here forever. So that's one really interesting thing. And honestly, a big misconception people have with crypto when they talk about, you know, the ability for people to launder money through it and all this. And yeah. what the truth is, is, yeah, sure, it's it's relatively easy to hide away money in crypto or, you know, keep an anonymous identity. But for you to ultimately turn that cash into any productive thing or go buy anything or get it to a bank account, you have very, very smart people online that could read everything about this. And, and you've even seen it years and years later, people getting caught with crypto because they try to finally cash it out in some form. And there's been people watching these things forever. So I'd be happy to do kind of a walkthrough some other time on, on what other skin is like, but basically a very cool just database for you to really see everything happening. So mm -hmm. here's my wallet address. If you put this in, you'll really be able to see every transaction that this wallet's ever done. Trades, really everything. If I transacted with someone, you can click on them and see what it is. It's mm -hmm. a very, very good source for evaluating DeFi tokens themselves. For example, if I just take this token, for example, what you can do is view how many holders there are, the total supply, but you can really dive into the weeds more. You can view the contract itself. So if you are very tech heavy, you can read the contract and make sure that you know everything's up to speed there. You can dive in further on the holders and see the exact amount of tokens that everyone holds. So just a lot of good general rules of thumb of, okay, maybe, I, maybe not a token of I want to buy if the top 10 holders are holding 30% of the supply. They could dump on us at any time, right? Yeah. And you bring up a good point as well, too, as far as like, if anybody knows your wallet address, they can theoretically see how much crypto you hold. So 
if you're ever transacting or trying to receive or send crypto to somebody you don't know, maybe it's better off you're doing that from the exchange where like the doing it from the exchange, they have their main wallet and then they have the, your kind of divvied up wallet amongst that. You're, they're not going to be able to see exactly what you're holding, where it's gone, this, that, and the other thing versus like if you were to share your ledger um, address with somebody and you send it to them, the, like now they know, all right, on this guy's ledger, he has this, that, and the other thing. Let's see how we can pull up on him, right? So so definitely, uh, yeah, if that's one thing that you brought up that's very um, important to know that as well too. At any moment, anybody um, can know what you're holding in your account. Definitely. And that, that is a, a really great point. And, and that's, that goes two ways for a lot of people. You know, some people like to, show it off in a sense. Um, Other people really don't want anyone to know what they have. And then there's a lot of other people that, you know, have tried to remain completely anonymous. And then you have someone who's very smart at reading the blockchain or goes in and does a complete deep dive and they're able to to kind of dox this person. Um, You have a lot of people that have way more than one wallet. So yeah, a a lot of different things going on, but a great point, Rob, that's Mm -hmm. absolutely something to consider. So Going back to to something I mentioned, how there's all these different networks. Okay, there's different assets on these networks, and there's reasons to really explore these different networks. So how is that done? Okay, if you open up MetaMask and you see you're on Ethereum mainnet, and I switch over to Arbitrum or a different network, you'll see that there's no assets there. What you have on Ethereum mainnet does not go anywhere else unless you make it go somewhere else. And there's no replication of assets in a sense. So if you have Ethereum on Ethereum mainnet and you want to buy something on Arbitrum's network, you need to do something called bridging. It's something that, to be honest, kind of of scared me off at first. I thought it was going to be a, a pretty big step. And then really once again, after I didn't do it and I, I noticed really kind of what I was missing out on by not having assets bridged to the new network, then I went ahead and did it and it took one minute. <laughs> so mm-hmm. Really with this, if Arbitrum's network, this is their official bridge. There's a lot of protocols out there that are bridges themselves. Hot Protocol, Synapse, Stargate, um, Stargate themselves. Yeah. Um, what they are is they're bridges. So you can really take assets from one network, send them over to different blockchains. MetaMask, obviously, is holding your account for all these different blockchains. So for you, it's a simple you know click to change the network. Mm-hmm. But really what you do is... I'm not going to bridge for the purpose of this because there's a gas fee and, and there's just not much balance in this wallet, mm-hmm. but you really just choose the amount. So mainnet means the Ethereum's mainnet itself. So say I have money on Ethereum, I want it to go to Arbitrum. You're really just going to put in the amount, say it's you know 0.009 Ethereum. And from here, you'll see you're paying a gas fee um, just as you did on Uniswap before because you're transacting on the Ethereum network. Once your money gets bridged over to Arbitrum, you'll notice that the gas fees are still there, uh, but they're maybe one hundredth of what you'd pay on Ethereum, which is why Arbitrum has become such an attractive kind of complement to what's Mm -hmm. happening on Ethereum now. It's allowed for all kinds of innovation and things that I'll show you after this that simply didn't make sense to do on Ethereum before because if you're transacting that much, the gas fees would really add up. Mm -hmm. So assuming I had the proper balance to cover the gas fees for this, this would be a simple um, pressing this button here, verifying the transaction in MetaMask as you saw the pop-up come on Uniswap. And from there, really just waiting for the Arbitrum network and Ethereum network to confirm the transaction. Then what you'll see uh, is you'll open up MetaMask and the Ethereum will have essentially vanished from your Ethereum mainnet. And you'll go over to the Arbitrum one network, which we just added from Chainlist. And you'll see that you have Ethereum there worth the same amount, offers the same function functionality, just a, a different environment in a sense. So with that, huh? Yeah, man, that's that's really <laughs> it. And that's uh, that's the crazy part where I thought it was going to be a, a really big lift too and was kind of scared to to take that step. Felt comfortable really just being on our on a uh, Ethereum and and really everything they had to offer there. And then I just noticed so much kind of traction in, in different metrics. Some things I'll I'll show later in this call. Mm-hmm. It just made me be like, screw it. You know, I'm going to explore one of these other networks. And and it ended up really being a breeze. Uh, so one, uh, this is essentially 
deemed itself the the king of the Arbitrum network. This is a protocol that I've followed very closely for a while, and it's a trading platform. So if you've used you know Femex or Binance, whatever it is to trade before, what you've been doing is you've been using you know a centralized party to trade crypto. There's a lot of pros and cons with both, but this is a really interesting alternative where this is a protocol powered completely by smart contracts. And it offers a lot of the same, or actually really the same functionality as all the other trading things with maybe different assets. So what's really important to note with this is that everything you do on GMX, every time you make a trade, anytime you really do anything here, the transactions recorded on chain. So you're able to see all the trades you've ever done on chain. Uh, in turn, a really popular practice has been something called wallet watching, uh, specifically for whales, mm. being able to track the trades of what you know very profitable traders are doing and, and see if that's a trade that you want to mimic. So that's just one of the very important functionalities that that, that site Etherscan brings by being able to really view all that data. The interesting things with GMX aren't really necessarily any of its unique features. If you've used a leverage trading protocol before, it functions really the exact same way, except what you'll notice is you never need to create an account. When you're working with DeFi, when you're exploring on-chain, there's no accounts. It's simply you have your wallet and that's your identifier and you can go to any site on the decentralized web and it will know who you are, what your credentials are, and what you've done in the past. So that's really an interesting thing when it comes to onboarding and stuff. GMX, what they have done is they've built an insanely big community. They're killing it in fees, and they have a very dynamic token model, but they have very limited assets to trade here. Mm -hmm. uh, one benefit of other things, so another on-chain trading perp is called gains trade. They have a lot more assets able to trade. And on that, you're actually even able to trade things such as uh, foreign exchange. You're able to trade synthetic receipts of US stocks. Uh, so really interesting, offers a lot more kind of uh, alternatives to investing. But the really interesting thing being there's no KYC, which would be know your customer. There's really no centralized intermediaries where if you have a MetaMask wallet, you can be trading on chain instantly, which is something that I find extremely interesting for, for better or for worse. When I think of GMX though, GMX has been roof revolutionary in my eyes, not as a trading protocol. As I said, I think that they're a great trading protocol, but it's really nothing crazy special to me. The cool thing about GMX is it's actually owned because it's a decentralized essentially protocol, it's really owned by its users and by its token holders. So GMX released a token. And what you can do is you can hold this token and get the benefits you'd get of other tokens, which are, you know, corporate governance and you know, all the other stuff, chance of appreciation, whatever it is. But GMX was the first first mover in this trend called real yield, which is really what the Arbitrum network's been known for. And really me as a traditional finance person makes the most sense by far. A huge, huge issue people have had with yield or staking rewards in the past is that a lot of the times you're receiving the payouts in that currency of the token itself. And it's just diluting your supply essentially. And there's no true value, utility, or revenue being generated at all. GMX is actually, if you see, they have over, they have a billion in AUM. You'll see that they have essentially gotten $3 billion in fees. Wow. So really, really no joke. This is, uh, so this is actually a bit over portrayed. What happened here was there's a huge, huge, huge GMX uh, trader that was borrowing a multi, multi-million dollar position, and he paid a very lump sum of fees. So this number is much higher than it would be. However, what you can kind of see is there's a lot of trading on this platform. They've made a lot of money. And unlike a lot of the coins where people don't really know what's happening to the revenue as a holder, why are there no dividends? Why do I never see any of this revenue? 
GMX has kind of released this real yield model where if you're holding this token and you want to stake this token and lock it up, they're actually going to pay you APR. So you're getting paid interest just as you would for leaving money at the bank. The difference here is you're not being paid interest in the way that they're giving you more GMX and it's kind of, you know, who's the last to hold the hot potato (laughs) essentially, you know, you know, that game, the greater fool's theory, I I think is what they call it. What you're doing here is GMX as a protocol is actually making significant revenue in Ethereum and USDC and they return all revenue to stakers in the protocol. So you're actually getting paid in straight Ethereum and, and assets that you, if you're using DeFi, you likely have a high conviction on and think are going to go much higher. So for someone like myself, being able to hold an asset like GMX that I think will appreciate over time and get paid rewards in Ethereum, which I also think will appreciate over time, is a very attractive investment. And over time, traders, you know, gamblers in, in sports gambling or the stock market, whatever it is, the majority of traders will lose money over time. And this has proven the same with GMX and the protocol has done really well. And stakers have already earned significant, significant revenue, especially those were, that were earlier on. So once you get over to Arbitrum, there's a ton of protocols to explore. If you come from the traditional finance world, you'll see that people have taken a really unique decentralized approach to a lot of these things. And a lot of it wasn't doable before you got over to Arbitrum because the way GMX works is you don't want to be paying a a gas fee every time you open up a trade, maybe panic and close a trade, maybe adjust your stop loss. These are all on-chain transactions that require a gas fee. So Arbitrum allows that all to happen for much cheaper. Mm -hmm. Building off of kind of the Arbitrum stuff, a really, really helpful site I use. It's fully free. This team's honestly unbelievable for, for providing this much kind of free utility here. You can really see all the data, all the analytics you'd want to see about different chains. So these are all different blockchains that you can explore. A lot of times it gives you a sense of, you know, where are people bridging their money over to? What protocols are interesting? kind of what is seeing the most adoption. And right here, you'll see Arbitrum. Their total value locked on their network is up 66% this month. It's 28% this week. But furthermore, you can dive in and you can really see, okay, who on Arbitrum is is responsible for this? What's going on on Arbitrum? It's a cool way to find up and coming protocols that are maybe starting to to make some moves. Um, And just an amazing, amazing resource. It gets really in the weeds if you want to keep clicking on and kind of expanding through stuff. But you'll see here, <laughs> Arbitrum as a network is is approaching about $2 billion in TVL and GMX is responsible for a quarter of that. That wow. really shows how meteoric really their rise has been. But a lot of these protocols have, have really started to grow, get a lot of users. And DeFi Lom is a site If you're in DeFi, if you're really doing anything in crypto, amazing, amazing info to find new coins and and track existing investments. Yeah, this is a solid site, bro. Uh, That's a great resource. Thanks for sharing that. I did come across something on DeFi Llama right there. It was called Camelot. Have you heard of that? I have. Yeah, yeah. I know a lot about Camelot. Yeah. What is Camelot? Is that that another kind of undercover gem? So Camelot, I think, is, is... a very interesting protocol. I love what they're up to, and I think it has a lot of potential. Uh, but Camelot's token, which is Grail, has run up essentially 10 times since their public sale. Wow. So yeah, I'm not someone that can look at a chart like you can, Rob, or, or really dive in and break down a lot of the fundamentals to say, okay, this thing's overvalued or this thing's undervalued. But they've gotten a ton of a ton of attention for being essentially a launch pad for new projects on Arbitrum to launch, as well as a decentralized exchange like Uniswap or something like that. And I don't understand the mathematics and all the the crazy stuff in the background, Hmm. but some very, very smart people I follow in DeFi say what they're doing is an insanely innovative approach to a decentralized exchange. 
So really nothing I say in this or or mention any of these coins is really meant to be a, a recommendation at all. GMX, I think, uh, is going to continue to grow. At the same time, the, the coin has performed insanely well and, and up several hundred percent this year where it, it might not be the best time to to buy. It's something that everyone should really evaluate on their own. But the importance of a lot of these protocols and the importance of, of this DeFi ecosystem is really what I wanted to show here. Yeah. And the sometimes like you can't you can't hit them all. I remember Matt last year in uh, summer of 2022 was like, brother, you got to look at GMX. I remember pulling it up. It was $5 per token. I didn't bite the bullet. I missed that boat. Now it's, what was the price at? Like $80. So it's like 13X from when you originally called to me less than a year ago. So yeah, I mean, it's definitely not a recommendation, but definitely deserves some reassessing here. Definitely. So yeah, really kind of just wanted to wrap this up with with one DeFi Llama, which in my opinion is, it happens to be free, um, but it, it's also, in my opinion, constantly adding new features. One of the best just, general analytics platforms for on-chain data that I've found. Their scan, which you can put in any token, you can put in anyone's wallet address and use it to uh, track whale wallets, use it to dive into to further info on tokens. You can even see latest transactions and you might find a new coin or a new token that people are trading that maybe just launched. Mm-hmm. A million different things to be careful from uh, in that world of, of things to evaluate, but Happy to dive more into other scans sometime. Uh, the last resource being this, which is really made for whale watching. Obviously, you see a huge balance here. This is definitely an institution of some kind, probably managing a, a bunch of money on behalf of a lot of other investors. Mm. But what you'll see is this is a great place where if you get in the weeds and and you're holding assets on five different chains and you want to organize your own situation and have it broken down in a really attractive way. This is a free site that simply just provides a, a great user interface to all the things happening across your your various wallet, your various wallets and blockchains. Also, what they have here is whales. So, you know, if you do go on whales and you find a wallet that looks really interesting, or you find a wallet that, you know, just made a big profit on a trade, maybe you want to watch that wallet and you can really see essentially in real time all the moves that they're making. Mm. And maybe at the very least, you see, okay, they just made a trade on this token. Maybe I want to do some research on this. Maybe I want to see what's up with this. And this is actually a zero knowledge proof token called Panther Protocol that's been really hot right now. So Mm. this person was in it eight days ago and the price was a lot lower. So you, you can kind of see that there's some smart people out there and a lot of times, some of the best research you can do is, is really just trusting people that have a, a very proven success record. Yeah, because if they're going to throw a hundred thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars at something, they most definitely know what they're doing. They're not just shooting kind of shitting into a bucket. <laughs> you, well, you would hope so. <laughs> and one other thing, Matt, before we kind of hop off, is uh, Frax Finance. What can you tell us about Frax Finance? Is this like? With all this talk about stablecoin regulation and this, that, and the other thing, I've seen over the the weeks now talk about Frax being kind of like running off that narrative. What what is Frax Finance? I saw it was like a decentralized or like a one of those. Is it an algorithmic stablecoin like Luna, or is this something that we should really keep our eyes on? Sure, sure. So yeah, Frax is a full. full- Full transparency, um, an asset that I've held for months, studied for a while, and really one thing that I think insanely highly of. Uh, one reason that I think so highly of them is because, yes, they're involved in stable coins, and yes, they're involved with liquid staking uh, derivatives, which is a huge narrative right now, but they're tapped into so many different areas where they've uh, labeled themselves as really a DeFi flywheel. So something that is doing so many different things covering areas of DeFi and they're all working together that, you know, when one of their things starts to do better, it drives all the other essentially factors to do better. So what Frax has done is they've been really ambitious with the roadmap and they've been able to deliver so far. So they've gained the trust from a lot of people and 
I'll put in a thread to put in the description of this from from someone on Twitter that I like a lot that does a really good job of breaking down the Frax ecosystem in a, in a 101 way. But really what you kind of need to understand is if a lot of these centralized stable coins are facing issues and stable coins are seeing regulation, Frax is a decentralized stable coin. So whatever mechanism keep the price stable is stuff that, to be honest, it is really beyond my knowledge level at this point. I haven't been able to really dive into all the true mathematics and, and really a lot of the mechanisms that kind of keep a lot of these DeFi protocols together. But I follow so many of the people that say what Fraxis stablecoin is doing is insanely innovative, is a great solution to regulatory risk, and is definitely something to, to kind of look into. The stablecoin side of things is not the main reason that I became so interested in Frax, but I think it's insanely positive. And like I said, just having more different pillars up there is just a great advantage. I actually took a huge, huge bet on Frax because I saw so much potential in their Frax ETH, which is essentially how they do liquid staking. At the same time, other topics that we brought up on this call, such as bridging assets, swapping assets, lending assets in decentralized finance, Frax has roadmaps for really all of these things where it's very ambitious and obviously they could fail, regulation could come in, there's always risks with everything in DeFi, but if Frax Finance was able to really pull off everything they hope to accomplish, or to be honest, uh, even a, a large chunk of it, then I think they are are very undervalued right now. Uh, so that's really where I stand there. Another thing I look at just personally, when I'm looking at any investment coins, stocks, really whatever it is, I mean, mostly for coins, I guess, is looking at the team behind it. Yeah, The guy behind Frax is, is a guy named Sam, who's constantly hopping on interviews, podcasts. Uh, I think there's a a podcast called the flywheel pod, which was inspired by Frax that he's constantly on. And he's just someone that I would, I would kind of want to back just looking at him and, and, and really just hearing from him and his vision. Definitely. And Tim Draper, I think that he has dragonfly capital. I'm pretty sure I saw last night that they're like holding their portfolio is like 40% consisted in Frax. Yeah. Um, and do you know, was that FXS or was that Frax the stable coin? I think that was FXS. Okay, gotcha. Cool, cool. So yeah, yeah and, and that makes sense, man. I know I know some institutions that have insanely large allocations to Frax, which really only reinstates my thoughts. Like a lot of the times, like I was saying with whale watching or looking at a lot of these institutions or betting on these teams, a lot of the times I, I can't go in and, and you know, debunk the mathematics behind how their stable coins being held stable or whatever these factors are. But I've spent years following enough of the right smart people that I that I know that, you know, these people are really onto something. And if it looks interesting enough, I can go in and do a lot of my own research. Definitely. Um, and yeah, yeah. To what you said, so Frax um F R A X would be their stable coin. Um so tied to a dollar. And then FXS, Frax shares, is essentially their governance in the way that you'd want to invest in them if you were interested. Nice. And yeah, and and to always double check what the smart money is doing, you can go to DeFi Llama, but also you can go on to coinmarketcap.com and look at, because they have uh, categories, you can look at Dragonfly Capital's then portfolio, and you can see for yourself that Frax is sitting in there. I believe Coinbase Ventures portfolio, Frax is sitting in there. So you're able to kind of sniff out what the, the smart money is doing. And likely they've done their due diligence because they have the team to be able to kind of go into the back end of all those systems. And they've likely given it the smell check. So yeah, 100%, bro. No doubt, man. No doubt. And uh, yeah, just really... Hope this was helpful for everyone. I stay in, in pretty uh, close touch with Rob, but if anyone ever wanted to dive further on DeFi or explore any of this stuff, would really be happy to. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And in the Discord, it's Matt Pearls. Is that right? Your username? 
Yep, you got it. Matt Pearls, we're going to change his nickname to the DeFi King. So <laughs> if you're looking for him in the Discord, just look for Matt Pearls DeFi King and you can shoot him a DM. And he's also got a, a newsletter. What's the name of your newsletter, Matt? Yeah, so it's a, it's called Crypto Clarity. Um, doing it on Substack, it's, it's a free weekly newsletter. So really the goal is not to make money off of that, but I have become essentially the central information source for a lot of my friends and the majority of my friends aren't tapped into this space at all. So that's really something I started to kind of, you know, send a weekly update of here's everything happening in the space that can be understood by anyone, regardless if you spend any time or have any background knowledge of crypto. So that's really what the focus is. We'll include a link for that in in the bio as well. And yeah, just really happy to be a resource. Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, although we're we're all heavily invested into those utility coins, XRP, XLMs, and stuff like that, there are other areas in this space that are going to excel and do very well. And as far as my expertise, DeFi is not one of them. So the community, you know, really lean on Matt here, Matt Pearl's DeFi King in the Discord for your DeFi questions. And if you you wanted to kind of go down the DeFi rabbit hole, yeah, happy to help. Happy to help. And uh, yeah, loving, loving seeing how the Discord's grown and, and really the the community that's formed there. So just really exciting to see and and um, also excited to see some, uh, some green numbers this year so far. Yes, sir. Well, Matt, thank you so much for giving this presentation. Um, we'll have to get another one scheduled in to do uh, kind of cover more of Etherskin and kind of some other kind of gems that you're looking at and ways of navigating some of these maybe uh, what's it called? The influential people that you look at and kind of how you go about vetting some of the information that's putting out. I think that would be a good follow-up video. Yeah. hundred percent would be happy to. All right. Thank you, brother. Awesome. We'll talk again soon. Cheers, bro.